Hello and welcome to the second video in this 19th century political developments series. This one is about the British experience of political change during this time and German and Italian unifications. The big picture is that the rise of nationalism was this very powerful force behind European politics during the 19th century. And we're going to see in this PowerPoint um, where nationalism starts to bring separate regions that used to be ruled by different people together under one banner. Um, widespread demands for political rights led to these revolutions and legislative actions in Europe. And Britain's really where those legislative actions are taking place. Uh, Italy and Germany became nation states long after the rest of Europe for very complicated reasons. But today we're going to hear the story of how they finally came all together. The revolutions of 1848 were a unique occurrence in Europe that showed a lot of the nationalist feeling that was bubbling beneath the surface. Because the Congress of Vienna made a bunch of decisions that were really, really unpopular and spread discontent in Europe, especially in Italy and the German states, because they did not unify those countries during the Congress of Vienna. They sort of made sure that they weren't getting too large and too powerful because they had that balance of power doctrine. But the people in those areas, not everyone, but a lot of them had uh, the new idea in their head that they should be living in a country based on their national identity, and that is not the situation they found themselves in. In 1848, riding this wave of nationalism, a revolution was successful in France, kicking out the king that had been imposed on them by the Congress of Vienna, uh, but similar ones failed in Germany and Italy and Austria, and as a result, uh, there were some significantly increased tensions. It built more nationalist ideas, and it showed that it could be successful, but also, it basically forced all of those feelings down below the surface. And, you know, you just sort of shove that down. And clearly, when you shove down your feelings, uh, nothing wrong can happen. The British, though, had a very different experience. Because in Britain, they had had a pretty stable government. They're separated from a lot of the... They weren't conquered by Napoleon, first of all, because he couldn't cross the channel uh, between... France and Britain because he didn't have a powerful enough navy to do it at any point during his reign. Um, and so he had other ways of trying to get at Britain, but none of them were very successful. So Britain came out pretty well. Uh, and as a result, they were prepared to have a more measured approach to dealing with all of the forces of change from the Industrial Revolution, from nationalism, from their control of colonies overseas, and that's fortunate for them during this time period because they start passing laws that help uh, release some of the tension from these new ideas without having to go through really horrible revolutions in the process. So they passed, for instance, these are just examples, uh, but these two reform bills are uh, ways that they manage the demands for rights of people who were these new working class individuals. Um, so the Reform Bill of 1832 expanded voting rights, doubling the number of voters in Britain, which is incredible. And they did that basically by uh, restructuring some of where the boroughs, which are like our voting districts, where they were and also who could vote, because uh, it used to be very, very based on property owning, which you don't really do if you're living in a city as much. Um, but then the Reform Act of 1867 made, gave the right to vote to all people who were heads of households which is a huge deal, so not to women. Clearly, it wasn't uh, you know, another 50 years until women get the vote. You always have to keep that in the back of your mind. That It's like, yeah, new rights. Not for everyone. And also, they ended slavery by law in 1833, which was of, you know, like a fair stretch before the United States. I don't know. It's not that long. It was that long. Uh, Italy, though, had a different experience. Uh, they were a bunch of little tiny countries and had been for a very long time either small countries, uh, city-states, or under the control of other European nations. But then there were some little bubblings up of some nationalist feeling uh, channeled by Count Cavour, who united northern Italy, um, and then also Giuseppe Garibaldi, who basically conquered southern Italy and then joined it to Cavour's northern Italy. And then finally and eventually, the Papal States, which is where the Pope lived and had control, um, including Rome, joined up with Italy. Uh, Count Cavour did not live to see that happen, and he was uh, the sort of architect, the mastermind behind a lot of this Italian unification. But then Italy was unified, and they had a single king called Victor Emmanuel, who was in control of the whole thing, and they were a nation for the first time in a very, very, very long time. Germany has their main unifying figure in Otto von Bismarck, who is a very intimidating guy and said very intimidating things and is fascinating to study. Um, he unified Germany through war and building nationalism. So he was a person who actually manipulated and intentionally built 
nationalism and a sense of common cause between German-speaking people in the center of Europe there. And that's impressive because any time that you see a person in history making use, they recognize and then make use of some of the powerful forces that they see shaping history, that's when you get some big deal people. And Otto von Bismarck is one of those big deal people. Uh, one idea that is very commonly associated with him is called real politic. And basically it said, this is very simplified, that any and all means to achieve power are justified. So anything you do, if it gets power for you and stability for your state, it is justified. And the saying that's associated with him, which we'll look at in a primary source document in class, is blood and iron, um, which is the idea that you can use industrial might, the iron, and the you know military power, the blood, to achieve more power for you and your country. So here's how it actually happened. Bismarck sneakily provoked a war because he's both really into military and also a really super sneaky, awesome diplomat. Um, uh, he provokes a war with France to get all of Germany on his side, right? Common cause for the German-speaking people. Then the Germans win in just over nine months. All these little tiny German states are <coughs> attacking into France. And the importance is that it this war led to the creation of the German state, single country that was led by uh, Prussia, which was the most powerful of those German states. But it also set up a whole bunch of causes for World War I, which we're going to be learning about in the next section of this unit. And that's all for this PowerPoint.